Hey, buddy. What the is that? What the is that a? F hey, okay. don't look at me like that. That's a weird look of. Okay. Blink, mother. Hey, get the f out of here. I don't even know if that's a. F Love and Monsters is a new VOD release movie about a fully fictional world where the dangers of the outside have forced all of human race to hunker up inside to survive. A world overrun by all kinds of deadly mutated monsters. Basically, the story is about a young survival Joel who leaves the safety of his home bunker in order to travel 70 miles across the monster infested west coast to get to his long lost girlfriend that he hasn't seen in 7 years, meeting various friends and foes along the way. And I gotta be honest, it was a bit of a rocky start with this one. You know how lately we've been coming across more and more and more movies that open with a bunch of history lesson exposition voiceover that makes you wanna press the off button right away? Well, guess what? I got the 616. Yep, an asteroid heading straight for Earth, which rained back down on us and everything changed. Actually, I knew this one kid who was eaten in his sleep by a goldfish. Actually, the really big ones in our military took each other out. Seven years, I've been living in an underground bunker. Really, it's a great group of people and they all love each other. That aside though, the overall experience here seems to be mostly positive that most audiences did find enjoyment in. And I totally get why. The characters are quirky and lovable, the visuals are very cool and intriguing, the overall lighthearted tone is just what a lot of people are in need of right now. I mean, all you really have to know to get a good sense of this film is that even the companion dog here has more personality and emotional depth than your average Hollywood blockbuster human hero. Oh, 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 sorry. Okay, I won't touch it again. Was that your owners? Hey, did you think I was her? But all that said, the one aspect of Love and Monsters I'd like to focus on today is the monster aspect, because the way it handles that is pretty much an educational masterclass in how to actually build a movie monster. And I know it might seem a bit different here because this film doesn't have just one monster, but instead a whole bunch of different insects and animals that have grown into monsters through radiation. You know, we have frogs, we have ants, we have worms, we have things ripped straight out of my worst nightmares. I mean, just look at that, holy fuck. But the point is, the same mentality mentality applies. Whether you're building a single movie monster or a whole movie world of monsters, there's a couple of very valuable lessons here for you to learn. So let's learn. Let's take a look at the monsters in Love and Monsters and try to identify the key ways they are established and handled and so on and so on. Here's how to build a truly effective movie monster or monsters. <laughs> The first lesson to learn here is the notion of making your monster the absolute worst possible kind for your hero to face in terms of who they are. Mm -hmm. Like I mentioned, this film doesn't have just one monster, but the point is that radiation has filled the surface world with every kind of monster imaginable. And so in order to survive that world, you have to be able to adapt and react, to think fast on your feet. You have to be ready for everything, because the possibilities of what you're going to be facing are nothing less. What was that? What's Could going have been on? a lot of things. Tree flamer, herd stomper, limb snapper, limb crusher, <laughs> rock diver. My favorite, the chumbler. Okay, I get it. A lot of names. And when you look at our main hero, Joel, he's not exactly that. He always stays in his bunker to cook and clean because that's all he knows to do. He's never even gone out to face monsters because he's just not the type who's built for it. You guys need help. I can help. Let me help. Are you going to make me say it? Say what? You can't handle it, Joel. You're shook. You're a liability. And when a monster breaks into the bunker and is killing Joel's friends, he storms in to help with full confidence that he actually is capable of those very things others say he isn't, now finally coming face to face with a monster for the first time. But whereas every other Hollywood male or female empowerment movie would have him kick the monster's ass right away to show what a capable badass he actually is, what happens here is the opposite. Did I shoot at her? Did you? What do you think? Right, so in a world of monsters where the only way to survive is to be ready for everything, our main hero is someone who isn't ready for anything, making this world of monsters for him seem like an insurmountable obstacle. What if I have uh, terrible instincts? You'll die. Which is exactly what you want. 
Firstly, in terms of the hero of your monster movie, this is how to effectively build one. Even though Joel is the least suitable person to go on the 70 mile journey to reach his old girlfriend, he goes on it regardless, because his willpower and motivation are so incredibly strong. He still isn't equipped for that journey by any means. He still gets saved by dogs, he still gets saved by old men and little girls. But the point is, he pushes forward nonetheless. He does everything in his power to learn to fill those flaws he has relating to the monsters of this world world, all of which makes him pretty much impossible not to root for and support. But more importantly, in terms of the monsters themselves, this is how you create power. For example, after the girl and the old guy have gone another way, Joel now comes face to face with this insect monster, which is like a repeat of the bunker monster moment from the beginning. Except now, he's fully alone with nobody there to help him, forced to truly face this monster that represents the very obstacle that for him so clearly has been established to be insurmountable. And you know what he does? Exactly, he overcomes that obstacle. As in, here we have a guy least equipped to take down this insect monster, taking down this insect monster. Here we have a guy least equipped to survive a world full of monsters, surviving a world full of monsters. And that's power, that's impact, that's something you feel so strongly that you can't help but fully take part in. To be very clear though, I'm not saying that every monster movie should have a physically inept hero who knows only to cook and clean. What I'm saying is, is that your movie monster should be the kind that your hero specifically is least equipped to handle. Like if you have a monster that hunts with sound and can be beaten only with silence, then maybe your hero should be a family about to give birth to a baby, because giving birth and babies are notoriously unsilent. Or if you have a movie about a world of all kinds of monsters that can be survived only with the ability of being ready for everything, then maybe your hero should be someone who isn't ready for anything. Because when your hero is forced to face off against a monster or monsters preying on their greatest weakness and ultimately still rise up to the task to overcome that monster or monsters, that's power. Power that comes from the monsters. The second lesson to learn here is that your movie monster shouldn't be just some blank random monster, but instead something that holds a clear emotional connection to your hero. Again, this film doesn't have a single main monster to serve as the ultimate opponent, but instead the focus is on a whole world of different monsters. And so the danger then obviously is that all these different monsters we face ultimately become just empty CGI noise we have no ties to. For example, if you look at the insect face off again, you'll notice that all this big insect is, is a big insect. We've never seen it before, we've never had any dealings with it before. By itself, it carries absolutely no meaningful weight to us in addition to its physical computer generated appearance, which, as proven by certain other movies, isn't very good. Setas Ra's spear! He's drawing a pulpus to the Nile, to the source of all life. Why? To drink it. But to combat this issue, Love and Monsters deliberately builds an emotional connection between this big insect and Joel and us, by way of occasional flashbacks sprinkled throughout the story that showcase what happened to Joel seven years ago when the monster problems first began, which now culminates in this. Run, yo, run! You can survive this. I love you. I love you. Right, so once we realize that Joel lost his whole family to a monster, this big insect suddenly inherits a whole new layer of meaning. Because even though this specific insect maybe isn't the one who killed Joel's family, it kind of might as well be, because it is now made to embody this whole world of monsters that did. Suddenly, when the insect is about to kill the dog, the moment becomes a metaphorical repeat of the moment where Joel lost his family. As in, this world of monsters once took away those that Joel cared for, and it's now about to do the same exact thing. Thing. A random CGI encounter now suddenly carries a whole new sense of deliberate emotional potency. And there's really just one very specific way that makes us feel. Hey!
and the same mentality applies throughout the whole movie. These aren't just random CGI monsters we randomly encounter, but instead bigger and smaller metaphorical representations of the world that took away Joel's parents, the world that took away Joel's girlfriend, the world that keeps trying to take and take even to this day. Not emotionless, not meaningless, but instead anchored in emotional meaning for our hero and for us. But in addition to the monsters themselves, the same mentality of emotional connection also applies to the heroes as well, to flesh them out in a way that gives them depth. Joel isn't just some random two-dimensional guy on a journey to get laid, but instead someone with a very specific emotional place in the world of the story. The kid and the old dude aren't just some random quirky kid and old dude, but instead clearly understandable sums of the world. Uh, my dad got killed along with Elliot. My son. We all have stories like that, don't we? I mean, even the dog. It's not just a random dog, but instead it has a clear emotional anchor in this world of monsters that has made it what it is and affects what it does. Was that your owners? Oh, 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 what are you doing? If you want us to really care and emotionally invest in what's happening in your monster movie, then there has to be something between your monster and your heroes that we can actually care for and invest in. You know, if you have a child hero who lost his mom to cancer, for example, then maybe the supernatural evil that hunts him and those around him should be a physical embodiment of cancer. Or if you have a young hero trekking through a world of monsters, then maybe that world and its monsters should mean something to him. Point is, whatever you do, don't introduce a giant space worm solely on the basis that it looks cool. Because if looking cool is the only reason for your monster's existence, then odds are that there's nothing more to that monster or the movie it's in. The third lesson to take from this film is that each of your monsters or monster encounters should always be unique situations clearly distinguishable from others. See, because Love and Monsters essentially is a road trip movie where we continuously face new kinds of monsters we've never faced before, there's a pretty big inherent potential problem that comes with that. If every threat we face carries as few preconceived notions as the last, there's a very likely chance that they all become interchangeable and the movie becomes stale. However, in addition to just a typical Hollywood Band-Aid solution of making the CGI visuals look different, what this film shows is that there's a couple different very effective real solutions for this problem as well. One solution, for example, is to continuously raise the sense of danger and challenge in each encounter. At the end of the second act, we face off against this massive worm creature which we've never seen or met before. And to be clear, there do already exist some core differences in how the sequence plays out compared to the earlier ones, because it's a worm instead of an insect, it's all about sound instead of sight, and so on. So on. But the biggest difference you'll find was already set in motion an hour ago. What you saw were worker bees. What you want to avoid under all circumstances is a queen. How do I know if it's a queen? Back when we first met the girl and the old guy, Joel had this very close call with these ground-eating worms, after which we then heard that these highly deadly worms aren't actually anything compared to their queen, the one worm you really want to avoid. And just take a guess what this is. Yeah, so even though we've never seen this massive worm before, the film has still been able to lay a foundation for it to prop it up above all other monsters and encounters preceding it in terms of established danger and challenge. Meaning that so far, it's clearly different, it's clearly unique, we're moving further from where we've been before. Staleness avoided. But let's say that your new encounter just isn't bigger or more challenging than the last. What can you do then? Well, take a look at the finale battle here, for example. We have this douche back captain who apparently has captured and enslaved some ominous water creature to tow his yacht. But then, after those couple minutes of ominous talk and visual foreshadowing, all that creature ultimately is, is this. So here's this giant enemy crab. What I'll do is use Benkei here to flip over this crab on its back and attack its weak point 
for massive damage. <clears throat> Honestly, when this giant enemy crab revealed itself, I was pretty disappointed. Maybe part of it is because in the original script that I read, the final conflict was against Cthulhu, which in that version explained and encapsulated the mythos and theme of the world very well, but for some reason was changed. But even so, I mean, just look at this thing. It looks more dumb than intimidating. It appears out of nowhere with zero build-up. The whole sequence altogether is just more running and jumping, which we've seen done before and done better. But just when I thought that this film was going to be ruined by a finale that doesn't push us further from where we've been before, it then saved the day by doing something we hadn't done before. Once again, we need to preface this by going back an hour, to the moment we meet this thing that now haunts my nightmares. What are you so scared for? The older snows are nice. There can be nice ones? You can always tell them their eyes. Just look at their eyes. The point of this moment is to introduce the idea that not all monsters are inherently evil, which is then kind of forgotten about altogether until we get to the end of the finale. You can always tell in the eyes. What are you doing? Shoot it! <laughs> Even though this giant enemy crab didn't push us on a new level in terms of established danger and challenge, the thing that still makes it distinctly worthy is its emotional thematic purpose. So far, we've only ever worried about survival or what we're surviving for, whereas the purpose here becomes about finally fully understanding that not all monsters are there for us to survive against. This crab isn't evil, it's just been enslaved by the douchebag captain, and it isn't defeated by shooting it or blowing it up, but instead by setting it free. Something entirely new we've never even considered before, but still something that has been set in motion before. I would have personally preferred this finale to also take us on a new level of intensity, but even without that, staleness avoided. And even if your movie has just one monster instead of multiple, this is something to keep in mind. If we meet your monster more than once, then the further we go, the more intense and challenging those meetings should get, be that in terms of locations or dynamics or whatever. And if that's not possible, then then at least make those meetings be about something very distinctly different in terms of emotions and theme and meaning and so on so on. Preferably both. But whatever you do, just make sure to build us up to levels and purposes relating to your monsters that we haven't been on before. Because, I mean, that combined with the other stuff we talked about, it all functions pretty well here in this monster movie. So, why not in yours?